<laughs> I think I broke Unlike Uncle play. Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of you. Ithaca. Well, we're home. We're getting there. Now let's start by doing a little thousand mile an hour recap of what happens in the Odyssey at the homecoming. Odysseus is joined with Telemachus, but he remains in disguise. He scales the wall to his house and he pounds on the door. The suitors come out. Now remember the suitors are the guy that's after Penelope, the guys. There's a whole group of them trying to get her to marry him and, and get the estate of Odysseus. The suitors come to the door and uh, our hero, Odysseus, is disguised as a beggar and he just you know asks for some alms uh, one of the guys grabs a footstool throws it at him grazes him in the head Odysseus then flings off the disguise draws a bow and kills the first guy with his arrows and then he proceeds to slay all the other suitors once in the house Penelope, you know, this guy's just killed all the suitors. Penelope is still leery about who he might be. Uh, maybe this isn't Odysseus. Maybe this is just another breaking and entering, I guess. And so she sets up a, a test. She has the, the bed removed from the bedroom and brought to the hallway. Odysseus sees the bed in the hallway, flies into a rage. Now you think, why? That's odd I mean this whole thing is odd enough that's kind of an odd this lighting is kind of making me crazy here. Um, I wanted to get some mood lighting you know have it dark but this glaring in the eyes is kind of making me nuts let's try this and see if it works better so so why would he go in a rage about the bed being in the hallway well the the bed that Odysseus made is very special in that it's Apparently they have a fig tree in the bedroom and he built the the bed around this tree so that the bed could not be moved I guess as a as a sign of uh, the immobile I immobility of their union or something you know I don't I don't know but he built the bed around this fig tree so the bed can't be moved she had the bed taken apart brought to the hallway so when he sees it there he assumes that the tree has been killed the tree has special meaning so he flies into a rage now only he would know this right so Penelope says ah you're the real deal that's great welcome home happily ever after so that's your Odyssey recap now Joyce gives us a really fascinating parallel to the Odyssey in this episode. Now again, it's written in the catechism style, so we have this question and answer, question and answer. Now, at first read, it's sort of hard to follow, but as you study what's being said, the details really emerge. It's kind of, if you think about it like a trial, you know, they're trying to piece together what happened, and it's all done with questions. You ask a question, you get an answer, question, answer, question, answer. There's nobody sits down and tells a story. It's all done with question and answer, and when you get all the answers, you have a complete story, and that's what Joyce is giving us here. Is he's using this question and answer 
uh, mode to give us not only everything that happened, but behind the scenes details as well. It's actually a pretty brilliant way of structuring a, a chapter. Now, <laughs> I, I keep thinking, all right, this is going to be an easy one. I'll knock this out in a 15-minute video, and that'll be that. I've already done an introduction, so we're ready for the last episode. Well, not so fast. I'm going to break this into two parts. We have, and since you have the intro, you've already read this, so I'm going to break it in two parts. There's the first half where Bloom is with Stephen, and then Stephen departs, and the second half will be with Bloom in the bedroom with Molly. All right, so this video is on the first half and the time spent with Stephen. So let me give you some thoughts about the first half of the chapter. It's amazing, something this simple that I have to break it into two videos. I mean, that's how amazingly deep and so many layers that this book has, and I can't even barely touch all the stuff that happens in this episode. But we're doing the best we can. I want to open it to you, and you'll find your own nuggets. But let me give you some thoughts. This is technically the end of Bloom's Day. Even though it's not the, the final chapter, we have one more chapter. This is really the end of our story, uh, the end of Bloom's Day. Bloom falls asleep at the end and it's over, then we have Molly's soliloquy, but this is the end of the day. This chapter was written uh, as the last chapter, and then the Penelope chapter that, that comes after this was uh, actually written after this chapter. Does that make sense? So the... the um, this this was written to be the last chapter, and then the, the Molly chapter was written after. This, I don't know, comes after, it kind of makes sense that it would. In other words, he wrote this, this is meant to be the, the end, and then he wrote the other chapter. Okay, so let's take a look at this. You'll notice at the end of this chapter, there's a big black dot. Now, you may have seen that and thought it was like a printer error or a typo or maybe some weird symbol that kind of says end of the chapter or something, that big fat period was ordered there by Joyce as a big period at the end of Bloomsday. So I don't know if you notice that. Go back and look in your book. There's a big, it's not just the ends with a period. There's a big fat dot there that Joyce, you know, it's it, he's takes liberties with punctuation. And uh, so people say, well, he's, he doesn't use periods or commas. He punctuates weird. So he ends Bloomsday with a big fat period, which I think is it's Joyce's usual humor. And it's interesting because he's telling us that's it. After this, we have we meet Molly and get her thoughts, which is very fascinating stuff. But this is the end of Bloomsday. Okay, so go back and look at that dot. It's kind of interesting trivia to know about that. It's the grand finale. Who says Joyce hates punctuation, right? Now, as I say, there are two parts. There's the part with Stephen, and then there's the part after Stephen. I'll deal with that in a separate video. Now, with Stephen, we have two main personalities that are interacting and intersecting and moving together. We have the, the scientific and we have the artistic or poetic. An example of the scientific is, you know, Bloom opens the tap and he thinks about the water and it starts at the reservoir and it's certain amount of pressure and it travels distance in a certain size pipe and water has all these properties. He goes into all those details about water. That's Bloom's mind, you know. It's, somebody asks Bloom a question, and then he's he will explain the phenomenon. Remember, they call him the phenomenologist. So Bloom has all this sort of scientific stuff, and he loves that stuff, and he loves talking about those things. We see Stephen, on the other hand, thinks of these poetic things as as the evening progresses, and then when the guys get out into the garden. 
we get a sort of merging of the two. It becomes expansive and, and very poetic. So again, focus on that, that we have the intersection of the two big personalities and the two big themes. And it's why these guys aren't really connecting and it's why they're not going to get together. The, the scientific and the artistic, the poetic, they don't fit. And that later on we get this incredible description of the evening. And it, I'll quote that when we get there. So it starts with the guys arriving at Bloom's house. The wanderers have made it home. They're both wanderers. They're both keyless. Remember, Stephen gave his key up to Mulligan, and he said that uh, he's not going back anyway, so he just gives up the key. Bloom has his keys in his other pants. He remembers that in the morning that the keys are in the other pants and I think they went to the cleaners or something but he doesn't have his key and he remembers that after he leaves he feels in his pocket and he's keyless they're both keyless Bloom also thinks in this episode about the ad that he didn't get placed for keys remember that ad he was trying to sell to uh, with the cross keys and he went to the library to get the the uh, picture and all that stuff and he tried to get the paper to buy in to give him a little puff piece and he worked on that today and he didn't get the ad so Bloom is he's keyless all around they they can't get in the house and so Bloom decides and remember I showed you the picture of Eccles Street how they have the the entrances you step down below and there's there's a gate there and then you step down and then there's the, the entrance well it's it's all locked up so Bloom decides to go over the wall hang from the railing and then there's about two and a half feet where he has to drop now Joyce's attention to detail is is bar none right so he actually wrote his aunt and had her measure the drop at that address and he wanted to know if you know if a 38 year old guy that was this tall could he make that drop without breaking his neck because it wouldn't be very credible in the book even though none of us would ever know he wanted to make sure that was accurate so he actually had that distance measured so that the stuff that's laid out in this book is accurate and the stuff in this episode about two and a half feet and the Bloom's weight that's all accurate and Bloom fake character but it's the drop is accurate detail all about detail but the description of it how the bloom uh, scales the wall and then he uh, he's suspended in space right for a period of time and then he drops to the earth uh, it's it, you know not that big of a drop but I, I think it's fascinating the way he describes it the parallel is the scaling the wall to get at the suitors, right? So Bloom goes over the wall and is suspended in space and he b breaks into his own house. He gets in the house, goes up to the door, opens the door and admits Stephen and they go to the kitchen and prepare a uh, cocoa and have a delightful, interesting conversation. Now, as Bloom prepares the cocoa, we see all these acts of hospitality. In fact, one of the questions is, what are the acts of hospitality? And they're laid out for you. They're noteworthy in that Bloom, it's, you know, it's two in the morning. He's had a very long day. It's not a real pleasant day. He's still putting Stephen above himself even though he's got to go up and deal with Molly and the assignation that's happened today. It's been a hard day for old Bloom and yet he still is thinking of Stephen. He puts Stephen first as the perfect host. He gives him the, the cream that they have on reserve for breakfast. He rather than use his favorite mug he selects two mugs that are the same <clears throat> so that the guest doesn't feel that he's using a different thing, you know, so make them both the same, make him at home as much as possible. And so Bloom, always Bloom, is being the gracious, hospitable host. And as he bends to, to light the fire, I think it's interesting that Stephen thinks about all the people in his life 
that have started fires for him. And he remembers back of parents and teachers and his mother and aunt and, you know, all kinds of people that have, have started fires for him, which I think is very touching. It's, it's a lot of beautiful stuff. This, this episode is to be really really savored and I, I it's become a running joke that I say with every chapter you need to go back and read it slow this one you need to really make sure that you get it before you go on so <clears throat> if you read a page and you don't really understand what's happening go back and read it again and really pay attention to it until you get it because there's so much richness this chapter is one of the great beauties in in literature and Joyce said it was his favorite chapter to write so it's it's worth giving it it's worth giving it the attention now what happens these guys talk about a number of things and they really don't they don't connect they do in that they enjoy conversation and they seem to enjoy each other's company enough but they're really not connecting bloom gets a fantasy of having Stephen move in that it would be great if he would live with them he could work on Italian pronunciation with Molly because she sings these Italian arias so it'd be great Stephen could help her with Italian they have a piano he could sing with Molly so they'd make an income source that would be great for Stephen he, he could use some money she could use the training and and he could teach them poetry it'd be all just one big happy soiree right they could play music talk poetry uh, make a few bucks on the side singing everything it'd be paradise he'd have a place to live and it, it, it would all be great they'd have the the son they always wanted the intellectual he'd have a roof over his head and the, the loving household and he could write in his spare time well <laughs> That isn't going to work. That's the end of the line right there. The the idea of writing in his spare time. Stephen intends to devote himself. Getting hoarse here. Stephen de, de, uh, is just hell bent that he's going to support himself with his art, and he's going to do that and nothing else. So this isn't going to happen. He's not going to live with the Blooms and write in his spare time. He needs to devote himself to his writing. Bloom asks him if he wants to just stay the night. He declines. Stephen doesn't even want to do that. He knows that if he starts to get wrapped into this, that it's going to stick, and that could be it. So he's not going to even be there for a night. Bloom gets, gets it enough. He doesn't fully understand Stephen, obviously, but he gets it enough not to challenge him. Bloom is not the type to argue. He's made the offer. He's made a proposition. It's declined. He's not going to argue and say, come on, you need to do this. It'd be the right thing to do. You know, he's not going to do it. He accepts that this is not going to happen. And Bloom has other things to deal with, too. So this is not the only thing on his plate. They after reaching that agreement, they're going to go outside. Stephen's going to leave. Bloom is going to walk him out. Now, notice how much like the end of a mass, a Catholic mass, this is. In fact, the cocoa is called mass product. So this whole time in the kitchen with the with the entry, the, the mass, the communion, the exchange, the... Um, little mini sermon uh, the the offer and then the uh, exi exiting processional is very much like a mass in fact the exiting uh, processional is very much like a mass and that Bloom leads with the candle and Stephen follows with the ash plant with his hat on it and when he steps outside Bloom puts down the candle and Stephen puts on the hat. Now, in the end of a mass, that's it, the mass ends that way. With the the priest takes his hat and puts it back on when he comes in for the mass. It takes his hat off, and the altar boy takes it away. And when the mass is over, the altar boy brings the hat back, and the priest puts it on. And 
out he goes. So this is very mass-like. When they're when they step outside, I I just I have to read this passage because I think it's it's an incredible description. Particularly, you know, you see all the telescopes I have back there. There's a little bloom in me, probably too much bloom in me. This description of the night sky, and I can imagine this. I felt this at 2 o'clock in the morning myself when I've been out with the telescope. As they step outside, the heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. It's a, a beautiful description of the, the sky. You can see this array, and the stars are hung on the night blue. You ever notice how the sky gets that sort of weird cast of the bluishness when there is no moon to give it that yellowishness, and there's a humidity that makes things just not crystal sharp, but just enough to, to give it a, a, a light haze. It's a, it's a wonderful description. This is a description by somebody who's who's looked at that. He didn't make that up. He's seen that. Is that you know, as I say, you may think, yeah, I can picture that, unless you've been out on a night when there's no moon. And he said there's no moon, but there is a moon. I'll explain that in a second. But it, unless you've been out in a night where there is no moon, it's all stars and there's a light humidity. Um, it's hard to imagine that, but if you've seen it, you know exactly what he's referring to. It's a brilliant description there. I love it. So, we get that. Now, Stephen looks up into the upper story and he sees a light in a window. And he asks, you know, who's, what's that, who's that? And then Bloom explains, and it says directly and indirectly, he explains that it's uh, it's Molly, he kind of blows it off. So Molly is still up. She's up, the light's on, and so we have this description of the night sky with the, with the, you know, stars hanging on the tree and the humidity. And he makes a point that there's no moon, but then this one big light is is our moon. It's perfectly positioned. I mean, the, the, the timing of this is brilliant. I mean, you can look up the date and see that there was no moon on, on Bloomsday uh, on uh, June 16th, 1904, new moon. So Joy's just, <laughs> this guy gets everything, and so we have the light in the window, and that serves as our moon. And then he explains the phenomenon of the solar system and notice his words that go with the moon that it 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 can make you crazy it controls emotions it controls the tides it tugs on the earth very similar things to what bloom is feeling for molly and so that light up there serves as our moon and then we get this very beautiful description of, of what the moon does and think of that in terms of Molly's force on Bloom. So it's, we're in genius territory here. So the guys decide to pee together, right? So they've had coffee and cocoa and Stephen's been drinking and he's about to head out and they side by side and they pee together and there's a description of Bloom's arc is is not that high but it's far and Bloom used to have the highest arc when he was in school I guess it's guys in the peeing contest Stevens is much higher but not as far this is sort of reminiscent of drawing the bows and and slewing the uh, sl Wiping out the, uh, slewing the suitors, that's what I want to say. Slaying the suitors. So the, the guys are drawing the bows, right? It's a, the, the really fun stuff. It's something that guys would do, you know, not slay suitors, but 
pee together in the garden. And they and they look up and they see the the shooting star. And there are many references to apparitions in the sky at key moments. There was a uh, a supernova around the time of Shakespeare's birth. There was a comet around the time of Stephen's birth, uh, and around Rudy's birth. There's there's mention of apparitions in the sky at key moments, which I think is also rather interesting. The way Joyce is giving us this cosmic picture. Now we're taking this one day in one guy's life and we're making this as expansive as the universe itself. This is the universal story. This is the universe in a nutshell. Okay, we're compressing that entire expansiveness of time, which is fascinating. And Stephen is is called by the universe. Stephen is departing. He's flinging into the darkness. He will depart, and Bloom is pulled by the moon. And you notice there's a, there's a reference to the centripetal and centrifugal forces. One is thrown out by the force and one is pulled in. Bloom is pulled by the moon into his orbit and Stephen is flung out into the darkness. Again, there's, there's so much. Of, I mean, here it is. I'm 25 minutes into this video and, you know, I haven't hit half the chapter yet. It's phenomenal stuff. I want to read the unlocking of the gate for Stephen to leave. Gate, door. So how did this centripetal uh, remainder afford egress to the centrifugal departer? So how did Bloom let Stephen out? Now, listen to this. By inserting the barrel of an aerogenated male key in the hole of an unstable female lock, obtaining a purchase on the bow of the key and turning its inwards from right to left. Boy, I'm butchering this. Go back and read it. Withdrawing a bolt from its staple, pulling inward spasmodically an obsolescent unhinged door and revealing an aperture for free egress and free ingress. He's inserting the, the male key into the female lock, spasmodically turning it around, freeing it, and withdrawing, revealing the aperture for free ingress and egress. Obviously sexual reference, but I think more than that. Who's doing this keying? Bloom. Old Bloom is back in the saddle. Okay, I think there's a reference there that Bloom has opened it. He's he's freed himself, and I'll hit some stuff in a in a second to back that up. There's another really beautiful chapter that I'll, or a, a paragraph here that I want to read. I'll probably butcher it too. Please go back and read it. So the guys are out. They're looking at the stars. that it was not a heaven tree, not a heaven groat, not a heaven beast, not a heaven man, that it was a utopia, there being no known method from the known to the unknown, an infinity renderable equally finite by the suppositions probable opposition of one or more bodies equally of the same and of different magnitudes. Now look at all the contrasts of the same and indifferent, 
of of position and superposition and juxtaposition. Look at what he's doing here. A mobility of illusory forms immobilized in space, remobilized in air. I'll explain this in a second because it's very profound what Joyce is doing here. A past which possibly had ceased to exist as a present before its future spectators had entered actual present existence. Now, go back and read that over and over and over and try to digest it. What he's saying is that when we look up into the sky, the stuff we see, you're looking at the past. It takes the light, thousands of light years to reach you. So what we see, the actions we see, the positions we see, any events we see, those are all things that happened well before we were even born. And that, I mean, that that is a true scientific principle, and he's laid it out amazingly poetically. You just, you have to go back and read that. That's just incredible stuff, what he's doing there. So Stephen goes, we hear the church bells, and then we hear the footsteps and a Jew's harp as Stephen goes away. Bloom is now a changed guy. I believe that Bloom has beat the demons. Let's take a look at this day, okay? Bloom serves breakfast, takes care of the cat, fortifies himself with a kidney, and then he heads out. Now, he's undergoes his baptism to prepare himself for this journey, this epic struggle. He goes to Hades and deals with that, all right? He fights the citizen. He defends the widow. He's had pleasure from Gertie McDowell on the beach. He's given support to Mina Purefoy in labor. He's protected Stephen. <laughs> he's fed animals along the way, where he's, he's fed the dogs, he's fed the birds, he fed the cat. He's done battle with all his demons in Circe, sort of that, that horror movie idea that, you know, if you have a thought of the worst thing that you fear that's what happens all of that comes out in Circe all the tormentors come out all his embarrassments come out all his guilts come out all his demons are there and he deals with all of them and at the end we get that beautiful picture of of Rudy d d dressed nice reading Hebrew studying his Torah it's all resolved. We know it's resolved. He rescues Stephen from the police. He gets him to the cabman stand. Bloom sees through the counterfeits. He knows that the sailor is a bag of wind. He he protects Stephen from the from the fraud, and he gets him home to safety, and then launches him to his career. Bloom has done a lot today and I believe it's changed him. Bloom blooms. The wanderer is home, his day is done. Now Bloom is still Bloom. The body is still important to Bloom as we'll see. But Bloom is a different guy. He's changed. And we'll learn about that change from Molly. So we'll We'll see what happens there in the next part. But he's not the same guy that left the house. Changes are not obvious to us. But the wife knows. She knows there's a difference. Stephen is gone. We see Stephen fade to black. He goes into the darkness. 
that's it for Stephen. I think Joyce wanted us to know that the book is done, right? Now we have way back where Mulligan says, oh, he intends to write something in 10 years, that Stephen will write the great book. And then there are references to the, the remember the, the line about the best book to come out of our country in years? Uh, it, it reminds one of Homer. Okay, so Stephen, the book is done. That's it. We've, we've finished. Stephen is gone. Now, remember that line, the, the boy of Act 1 is the mature man of Act 5. That's what we've got. Bloom has bloomed. This is about the mature man, okay? Joyce, I believe, conquered his demons and to an extent grew up, matured. He finished the book. This was it. This was his life's thing was to write this book. The other stuff was good, writing exercise, make money, eat. This book is it. This is his life's work. Now the, the next book, Finnegan's Wake, that was his labor of love. This was his contribution to the world of art. And I believe Joyce is telling us that by putting Stephen fading into the dark. I need to say a couple of things. One is, I mean, here it is again. I'm pushing 40 minutes, and I've only done half the chapter. I feel so inadequate to express the depth that's in this chapter. I hope that I give you enough to stimulate you to go back and really, really get it. The other ones I say, read slow so you enjoy it. This one, read slow so you get it until it it, it hurts. This chapter is so rife with beauty. I mean, the poetry, the scientific stuff is very interesting, the way Joyce weaves it with the poetry, but it's fantastic that the things that he covers. I just, I feel really inadequate here to to express it. I hope this helps you. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I, I love this chapter. There will be a part two video in a couple of days. I'll release that and we'll get what happens when Joyce, uh, Joyce, when Bloom reunites with Molly. Until then, Slancha, thank you, and we're almost there. So long to Stephen. Upon my yellow hair.